Good evening, everyone. Hello. Thanks for coming out uh, tonight uh, for another one of the lectures in the Cornwall Iron Furnace Lecture Series. I have pieces up here. If you are interested in joining our association, uh, we have membership applications up here, always looking for new members, and that's a way in which you and the community can help to support the museum. So if you have the inclination, please come on up and do that. And if you have any further information or, or need further information, you can either talk to myself. Uh, I have another board member here, Nancy Ladd, and I have another one of our good volunteers, uh, Bruce Chadbourne, uh, who also uh, lives here at Cornwall Manor uh, in the woods. So don't take my word for it. You can go ahead and talk to these folks as well. So uh, I thank you for that. So now, uh, our speaker tonight is Mr. Jim Lores. I met him yesterday. He seems like a nice guy. Uh, that's not true. Actually, I just want to go back uh, to 1995, where I was a snot-nosed kid in college uh, looking for a summer job and internship. And I guess I was the only person that applied because he hired me. So uh, I've known Jim since then. Uh, in 1997, he went and gave me my first full-time after-college job. And uh, I have been through four different museums uh, within our system, and this is the only one here at Cornwall where we've not worked together. Uh, Jim has been a site administrator of some really wonderful regional museums. Uh, he started his career at Daniel Boone Homestead, that's where he and I met. Uh, he was also at uh, Conrad Weiser Homestead, I always want to say Cornwall, I have to always catch myself, Conrad Weiser Homestead. Uh, did a, a stint at the Ephraim Cloister, and then retired at uh, Landis Valley Museum, uh, where he was the site director there for seven years. But all total, 42 years, yeah. Mm -hmm. 42 years with the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. Uh, that's not a record, but darn close. Uh, and, and Jim, I think, enjoyed every time that he was there. I won't say every minute. Uh, but he enjoyed uh, his time with the Museum Commission, and uh, Jim really gave me a lot of insight into many, many different things, uh, has been a wonderful mentor in that respect. But one of the things that Jim did in 1995, he said, oh, do you like old houses? And I said, sure, I like old houses. I, I always uh, grew up in an area where we had farms. Uh, my family had owned historic properties. Uh, so he took me for this driving tour of a place called Ole Valley, which the outsiders call the Ole Valley. That's not it, it's Ole. Uh, and showed me some of the best preserved landscape in eastern Pennsylvania. And that's really saying something. Uh, but this was a, an area where the entire township had been put on the National Register in the early 1980s because of how complete uh, the area is. And a place that he took me to in 1995 was a place called Kaufman Farm. At that time, the Kaufman Farm was still in Kaufman family hands. It sold out of the family in 1997 and dates back to the 1720s. Jim had been in that unbroken succession of the same family from the 1720s to the 1990s. And several generations worth of buildings were on that property. And, and many Pennsylvania German historians, people that are very interested in architecture, have always called this the most complete of Pennsylvania German farms. So uh, Jim's going to talk to us not only about this farm, but of course we're going to get into some things about Pennsylvania German architecture. And Jim is quite knowledgeable, so after the talk, if you have questions about the area, about these buildings, or even about that guy who didn't wear a coonskin cat, Daniel Boone, I'm sure he would entertain questions on that as well. So without further ado, I'll give you uh, Jim Morris. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Is there anybody who can hear me? Speak up. Oh, okay, good. Uh, sometimes I do well with amplification, and sometimes I do better just speaking. So we'll start out this way, but if anybody can hear me, please raise your hand, all right? So one of the great things about uh, being in the museum field was working with interns and, and students and Mike was one of my shining people through the years, and it was really, it's, 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 it's kind of cool to be able to see uh, people who started as interns uh, go into the museum field, and I probably have about a, about a dozen 
you know, the people who started with me as, as interns at either either Boone or, or Wiser or, or other places and are now holding positions of you know of either either directors or other other high positions in the museum field and and Mike I'm so proud of Mike as a new site administrator at Cornwall Iron Furnace, and he's a, he's a great guy. He's going to do a great job at, at Cornwall. So, uh, as Mike alluded uh, to, tonight we are doing a travel log to a far and distant and exotic place, which we call Berks County. Right? <laughs> Has anybody here ever been to Berks County? Oh, Raise yeah. your hands. Okay, a lot of people you have, and specifically. We are going to a part of Berks County, as Mike mentioned, uh, called the Ole Valley. Uh, does anybody know where Ole is? I know you do. Okay. <laughs> so this is a region east of Reading, and it's a valley that is about 10 miles long. It is based on the Schuylkill River, and it's actually currently it's it's actually composed of, of three current townships: Exeter and Amity Township in the south, based on the Schuylkill River and Ole Township to the north. Now, the, the two lower townships, Exeter and Amity, um, were settled in the 18th century, early 18th century, by mo mainly non-Germans. There were some Swedes, there were English, there were Welsh, there were Scots-Irish, there were Quakers. Um, and it's interesting that they're, they're, the land of those lower townships is, is largely shale, right? But to the north, Ole Township is limestone. Right? The Ole Valley has kind of different geology, and uh, uh, that good limestone of the north attracted German speakers in the early 18th century. And uh, certainly by 1750, uh, that entire township was fully settled. In fact, by 1750, all three townships were completely settled. Uh, but you had, you know, more German speakers to the north and more non-German speakers to the south. Um, and Mike alluded to the fact that uh, there's an incredible his, uh, preservation of architecture today within that region. And it's really great because you can, you can drive through the region and see really wonderful examples of early English architecture uh, and some great examples of Pennsylvania German architecture, primarily in Ole Township to the north. And as Mike mentioned, uh, Ole Township was really the first entire township to be placed on the National Register because of the, the great survivability of architecture and other landforms and, and cultural resources within that area. So uh, Ole is an incredible place. Ole Township is an incredible place, particularly for, uh, for the, the early German uh, architecture that, that, we, that we see there. Um, and you know, trying to pick out the best place in Ole Township. And there are, it, you could have some really uh, knock down, drag out arguments with some people over which farm or which house or which building. Or, and, and I should say that the whole region isn't just agriculture because we've got we've got mills of all different types. Uh, it was really one of the cradles of the iron industry, so you actually have uh, an iron making component to to the area. Uh, uh, Quaker meeting houses, your churches, and things like that. really great. But you know, if you, if you're looking at you know what? What is the great? What is the best site in the Ole Valley? There, there are a lot of uh, there, 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 there are a lot of competing uh, places, but uh, I, I don't think that many architectural historians would would fault us if we said that the Kaufman Farm <coughs> was in fact the finest farm, the finest site within within the Ole Valley. Um, one of the reasons is the fact that it does have this history of being in the hands of one family for 251 years, right? from 1726 to 1997. So, but there also is an incredible collection uh, of buildings, not all 18th century, but an incredible collection of structures. And you know, Mike mentioned it was G. Edwin Brumbaugh who called the Kaufman Farm the most complete Pennsylvania German farm. And he wasn't just talking about farms in the Ole Valley. He was talking about Pennsylvania German farms, period, right? Uh, and you can make an argument that uh, uh, it is really one of the most complete Pennsylvania German farms. There are many times when I would drive by the Kaufman Farm and, and wish that, that, that it was an historic site that I was administering. Uh, and uh, I administered some historic sites that, uh, you know, had some, uh, you know, gee, I wish we had a better barn or gee, I wish we had a better smokehouse or whatever. Uh, 
uh, and you go to the coffin farm, and, and there are all these buildings that, you know, which should be almost a, a museum, uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the farm is, to this day, uh, privately owned. And uh, you know, a couple things about the Kaufman farm. The current farm uh, is located in, uh, in Ole uh, Township, uh, and it presently comprises 120 acres. Uh, and uh, there are about 15 structures on site, and uh, we're going to sort of take a view, uh, take, a, take a tour of, of, so, of some of these buildings. Uh, the presentation tonight is going to be hopefully conversational, and if you do have questions in the middle, uh, or you have a question about something, or, or, or a photograph, or a building, please don't hesitate to, to raise your hand, and, or, or, or just call and say, Jim, you know, and, and I'll, I, will, I, will, I will respond. Um, I, I want to make sure that I cover some of my notes, and one of the things I want to say is that, uh, you know, we talked about the Kaufman family, and I want to, want to give you a little, just a, a little bit of Kaufman, a, a little bit of Kaufman history here. Uh, there, there will not be a test afterwards, okay? But in as far as the Kaufmans, and I'll try to make it as easy as possible, uh, there are really only two names to, to, you have to remember, right? David Kaufman. So David Kaufman was the first settler. He purchased uh, the, the, the farm, which at that point was, uh, was 370 acres in 1726. And David owned it until his death in 1762. Right? So everybody's got David down, right? The only other name you have to remember is Jacob, right? Because after David came three Jacobs in a row, right? <laughs> Jacob the first, Jacob the second, and Jacob the third. Not really. It was uh, uh, <laughs> Jacob Hoke Kaufman. So Jacob Hoke Kaufman, or Jacob the first, owned the farm. Basically, can sit, think about the second half of the 18th century, right? So that Jacob I owned the farm from 1762 until his death in 1804. So Jacob I is pretty much the second half of the 18th century, and he's pretty much responsible for the, the earliest buildings which currently stand on the site, right? So he died, his son assumed ownership. His son was named Jacob. Jacob. Jacob II. That's right. Jacob Jacob Hill Kaufman. So Jacob Hill Kaufman, and of course these are the names of their mothers, maiden name, you know. So Jacob Hill Kaufman, probably Berg was the name, right? Uh, Jacob Hill Kaufman owned the farm from 1804 to 1843. And he he actually is responsible for a lot on the farm, uh, including some of the major barns on the site. And he also was responsible for, in fact, reducing the farm from 370 to 120 acres. Right? We'll talk about that when we get the first slide up here. So Jacob Hill Kaufman, Jacob II, pretty much owned the farm about the first four decades of the 19th century. Right? So he died, and his son assumed ownership, and his name was Jacob. <laughs> Jacob. Very good. <laughs> You're going to pass the test. Uh, Jacob Kime Kaufman owned the farm from 1843 until his death in 1852. So he died just before the Civil War. He actually died a young man. Uh, and in fact, his, his son, who eventually owned the farm, was only five years old when his father died. Uh, but his son was Frank Kaufman, and the other, Kauf I'm not gonna give you all the dates for all the other Kaufmans, but Frank, uh, Frank owned the farm next, uh, and actually moved in to the town of Ole, and, and actually kind of rented out the farm, if you will. Uh, eventually, Frank's two sons, Donald C. and Roger, assumed ownership, and now we're into the second half of the 19th century, uh, they actually lived on the farm and, and were farming it. Um, and then uh, uh, Donald C. Uh, had a son uh, named David B. And David B. was the last owner. And he owned the farm until his death in 1997. So you have 251 years of Kaufman. But again, you only have to remember about David, uh, you know, David and then the three Jacobs. 
right? I'll try to make it easy, but at any rate. Uh, the, in 1997, um, the, the farm was acquired by the present owners, uh, and uh, uh, they have been very, very good stewards of this site. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll say a little more about what might be next a little bit later on in the program. So let's see. We've got this uh, wonderful gizmo here. And uh, all right. So an aerial view, an aerial view here. So what we have here uh, to the left uh, is basically most of that uh, larger farm, the 370 acres, uh, acquired by uh, David Kaufman in 1726. And this, this, uh, this site, great limestone land, it's located pretty much in the center of Oley Township. This road over here is Covered Bridge Road. It was one of the early north-south, north to south routes through the Oley Valley. Uh, just to the left, it would have to be off, off the picture, is another major road that bisects the Oley Valley north to south. Uh, this is Coffin Road that would connect between those two major routes. Um, and uh, the top of the screen here is north, this is south, obviously east and east and west. And the current Coffin Farm pretty much is defined by this. Okay, kind of comes over here. This is the current 120 acres, and these are the main buildings right here that we're going to be looking at, all right? Uh, the larger tract of land actually continued up. This is a tract over here, and it came over here. So the rest of this was uh, what was taken away from the farm uh, in, uh, in the year 1834. And uh, we'll talk a little more, uh, more, more about that later. But basically what happened was that uh, this was the, oh, I'm sorry. Hit the wrong button. So these are the buildings that we're going to be looking at this evening. This is the, this is the, the basis of the farm. And um, the very first structure built here by David Kaufman in 1726 was a log house, which was probably located right here. And the reason he found he, he decided to build here on all this acreage was a very excellent spring. And you can actually see the course of the spring, uh, which flows from the spring house down uh, today. The spring is still flowing really well. But uh, the reason that this house was built here is because of the spring. Now, sometimes when we think about the way settlers went about, you know, why they chose a house site on their land, sometimes we tend to think of, well, if you owned this much land, you'd build your house in the middle, right? But we have found in the Ole Valley in particular that it was far more common for farms to be located on the perimeter or the corner of the property than the middle, because that's where the roads tended to be, right? Uh, however, in this particular case, this spring was so good that uh, the, the early settlement was located on this part of the farm. And this farm developed, this is where the farm buildings developed in, in the course of the, the mid to late 18th century into the early 19th century. Uh, now, uh, Jacob II, uh, who was uh, Jacob Hill Kaufman, remember who owned the farm uh, the first few decades of the 19th century, 1804 to 1842. In the year 1834, he decided to split his property and give this part of the farm to his son Jacob, who was Jacob III, right? And he built a whole other farm complex up here, which he gave to his son Isaac. Right? That's where the cannon is located. Right? So this is the later 19th century Coffin Farm. And we'll, I have a, 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 few, a few photographs of that as well. But uh, it was 1834 when uh, the, the, the 120 acres was carved out of the larger farmstead. Um, here we have a more close-up view of these buildings, and uh, uh, you get a sense again here of, of this really great spring uh, coursing out of the spring house, which we're going to see. Uh, but uh, here is the uh, here's the main farmhouse, 
and we're going to be good. We're going to be looking at each of these buildings in greater detail. You can sort of see a little scar here. Uh, there actually was some excavation done, uh, overseen by the current owners, where archaeologically they found traces that we believe was the foundation of the first log house. So that first settler's house uh, was probably was probably located. Oh, there it is, right here. This is the main the main farmhouse on this complex, and uh, most of the earlier buildings which remain today. Uh, the, the buildings which we date mid to late 18th century are located uh, in this, this part of the property. Uh, these, are, these barns are, are 19th century, we believe, and then filled in between then are some other agricultural buildings built in the 19th century as well. Yes? In the absence of sewers and, and septic tanks and all that, are, yes. are one of those uh, uh, structures an outhouse? Uh, yes, uh, there's actually a little privy that remains today. Uh, privies were the were kind of the, the buildings that came and went, you know. So uh, it's rare to have a privy that's from the 18th century. The privy that is on the site today was probably built after 1900. Uh, but privies would have been part of the landscape of this site. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, I should also say that we're going to be looking pretty much at all these buildings in this look. Uh, in this, like, move this really fast. I lose this. Uh, here you go. Uh, we're going to be mainly looking at these buildings. I will say that on this end of the property, down here, uh, there are some other features. There's a lime kiln. Uh, there's a big, almost a quarry where maybe some of the limestone for these buildings was was, was dug. Um, there's also the family cemetery is actually up here in the middle, uh, right here on this corner, right, which is very close to both this farm and this farm. Is the uh, is the coffin uh, cemetery, and uh, what's interesting is that if you ever get to go to the coffin site, and you ever get the chance to go up to the cemetery, uh, it's a little bit of an optical illusion. Um, it is a long trek, and it is uphill, gradual, but uh, uh, it is a it is a long way up to that location. But it is interesting that it was located right here in the corner, so it, it, it would have served. Uh, both of these farmsteads, you know, going, you know, as, as, you, as you go in, and we know that, uh, I know the first two Jacobs for sure are buried there. Uh, I'm sure that David is there, but his, it, it, there's, no, there's no mark with his, with his name on it. So, uh, here we have, you know, these main, these main structures. Uh, one of the things that we, you'll notice uh, is that these buildings tend to line up a rel relatively, uh, they pretty much almost all face south, uh, and and uh, it, it, it's, if you take a look at these structures, you're going to see that they, they 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 tend to line up so that the uh, the ridge lines are roughly parallel to one another. And just some overall views of, of the structure. And remember, this is not a museum, right? This is not an historic site. This is a privately owned farm, and you know it wasn't too many years ago when this was. You know, the, the, the land today is, is farmed, by, by, but it's being rented out. Uh, we don't have, uh, currently, uh, there's a tenant living here in the one end of this house. It isn't like this is a, a, a working farm, but within my memory, I would say 25 years ago, it was a working farm, and, and uh, the barns were being used. Uh, but, but remember that, again, this is not a museum. These buildings have been preserved because, because of the interest of the family through the years, and certainly the current owner. But just get a sense of the overall view of some of these some of these structures. This is looking the other direction, and you get a sense of some of the 18th century looking buildings and looking back at these 19th century barns. Okay. <coughs> and you know, get a sense also of this incredible setting, uh, because uh, uh, the Oli Valley is a, an intensely farmed region, and when you're at the Coffin Farm. You are just surrounded by, by farmland uh, and the, the hills in the distance, which really define the valley. Uh, it's an incredibly beautiful setting uh, here. Okay, so here we are at the main house uh, here at the Kaufman Farm. And it's, it's very difficult to date these buildings really correctly, but um, this building uh, most likely dates 
to the early to mid 1760s. And the year 1763 has been attached to this house because a, a clay roof tile was found on site with that date inscribed in it. Uh, and so it's possible. Now we also know that it was 1762 that the, that the first Jacob Kaufman, uh, you know, inherited this farm. And so, you know, it, it is certainly possible that this house was built about that time. We believe that uh, here in the front, right here, you kind of see this scar, is where uh, the first settler's house may have been built, uh, built by, by David in the 1720s. But this, uh, this house, this house, this main house, uh, was most likely built uh, 1760 to 1765, and 1763 is a very possible date. It's actually built in two sections. So to the right, you have an 18th century uh, section, and then to the left is a 19th century addition, uh, which was dated 1834. Uh, you, might, you might remember, I mentioned the date 1834 before. That was the year that uh, Jacob Kaufman II split off the farm. And we believe in 1834, he built a retirement apartment for he and his wife, uh, and then turned this main house over to, to his son. This is the back of the house. And uh, you get a sense of the, uh, the again, this is the, the 18th century uh, section of the house, and the 19th century addition. And you get a sense of the different roof lines. Uh, again, uh, this was, again, the earlier building, and this the addition. And kind of the gable view of the same house. Uh, very steeply pitched roof. Um, let me, let me, I'm going to shoot ahead and then go back. OK. So this is the kind of looking on to the front of the 1763 section of the house. And this is a classic Germanic house. Um, it's asymmetrical, the main door is off to the left, and a little bit hard to see here, but there's a, a central, the central chimney comes up right here. And when you enter this house, enter this door, you don't enter a formal stair hall, but rather you enter the kitchen, right? In German, it's called the Kuche. And uh, in, in typical Germanic fashion, uh, this kitchen spans the width of the house. The chimney serves a huge fireplace, which opens to the left into that kitchen. And that central, that <coughs> open hearth fireplace remains today. Uh, and then behind the fireplace, to the right, are two rooms. To the front is a larger room called the Stube, <coughs> and then behind it is a smaller room known as the Kammer. The Stube in the 18th century was sort of the family gathering room. It had several different functions. It's where the family would have kept their, their finest pieces of furniture. It would have served as a sitting room and a dining room. Uh, and then the Kammer behind it would have been the sleeping chamber for husband and wife. So uh, that's pretty much the way, uh, you know, kind of the classic layout for early and mid 18th century Pennsylvania German houses. And this floor plan and room arrangement is based on houses which they knew in Europe. Now a lot of times when we talk about families like the Kaufmans and, and, and their, their life in the Ole Valley in the 18th century, um, we think in terms of them expressing their Germanness, and that certainly is the case. However, what's important to understand about the Ole Valley is that the Ole Valley was very Philadelphia-centric in the in the 18th century. Um, as, we, as we talk about, you know, these farms and what made them prosperous, um, what made them prosperous was grain, and the grain that they were growing for profit was wheat, and so. What was happening is that these farmers in the Ole Valley in the mid-18th century were growing wheat, they were milling it into flour, and then they were wag wagoning it to Philadelphia. That was their main market. And so these people had a connection with Philadelphia, and they were seeing the height of style. Now, by the 1760s, in Philadelphia, 
you have these wonderful Georgian houses being built, that which were you know kind of English influenced center hall houses, and and you have these some of the incredible interiors. Well, what's interesting about this house is that while the ground floor of this house is very much a Pennsylvania German farmhouse, upstairs there is a chamber directly above the Shuba, and it is appointed as a high-style Georgian interior. Mm -hmm. uh, and we actually don't quite know what the room was used for. Was it the sleeping chamber for Jacob and his wife? It's possible. But within this very German house is, uh, this is this incredible English Georgian interior. So it really kind of shows that there was assimilation happening, you know, very early in the Old Valley. I just want to go back briefly. Again, this is the gable view of that German 1763 house. This is the center chimney. Yeah. And you'll notice uh, in the attic, here's an attic window. But you notice this little window up top here. This is a doorway which we believe accommodated a grain hoist because where these farmers would have stored their wheat before sending it off to Philadelphia was in the attics of the house. And we know this uh, through uh, inventories and wills, and which an inventory will mention grain in the attic. And, and here is a proof of it. And there are several other houses like the Kaufman House in the Ole Valley that have these uh, windows that we believe it, it accommodated a hoist for, for storing grain in the, in the upper upper floors. The house has a, a lot of integrity. Uh, you know, the great great amount of the uh, uh, the windows, the, the, the stonework, etc., is, is is original to the house, original fabric. Uh, you've got these sandstone window surrounds on some of the cellar windows. Uh, and, and most of the double hung windows have are, are, are mainly uh, mainly original fabric. The uh, 1763 house is kind of interesting because um, you've got uh, while the while the, the sides in the back of the house are, are kind of rubble stone limestone, uh, the front uh, has courses of more squared stone, and you notice this pointing, this ribbon pointing, really accentuates. Uh, the squareness. It really has an effect. It really it, it, it gives you the impression that is a cut stone uh, front um, and, and a very formal facade. Also note the original hood over, over the doorway as well. This is a photograph of the attic of the main house. And uh, what you're looking at here is a, uh, an incredible framing method, which is found in some German houses in the Ole Valley, as well as some German houses in Lebanon and Lancaster County. Uh, this is called a Ligander Schule truss system, or a truncated uh, principal rafter. And, and, and we believe that this heavy rafter system uh, was meant to support a tiled roof. And we do know that some tile fragments have been found, and we have that one dated tile that was found. Uh, it's very likely that this house, when it was built in the 1760s, did have a clay tile, uh, clay tile roof. To the left is the uh, 1834 edition. Uh, again, it's a it's a much it's not a, a steep uh, a roof. It still has its original hood. Uh, this actually is kind of a Georgian house because uh, it's it's really a side entry Georgian. So uh, you go in this door and there's a long stair hall and then two rooms to the left. And uh, again, we believe that this was built as retirement quarters uh, for for Jacob Kaufman Jacob II. And you get, you get a sense of the, the gable of this 1834 edition is a, a much shallower roof line than, than the 1763 house. There we are. Um, OK, we can move on to some of the other buildings on this great site. So for many years, people driving by and stopping and looking at this house, uh, this farm, uh, assumed that this house, uh, also a center chimney, house with the door off to the side, very very much in keeping with the Germanic dwelling house, a lot of people assume that this must have been the first house on the property, you know, and the larger house was the second large house. That is not the case. Upon closer inspection, this building is an ancillary building. 
This was built as a support building with very support functions on the farm. It may have been built at almost the same time as the main house or a few years later. I certainly believe that this house predates 1770. The ground floor of this building actually would have been used for uh, rendering, for various cooking operations, perhaps it uses a summer kitchen. Uh, the spring actually comes up in the ground floor of this house and then flows out to the spring house. Uh, but there is a fireplace in this lower level. Uh, so various functions could have happened, support functions on the farm. Um, the, um, uh, you know, cheese making, uh, other kinds of functions could have happened in that, in that ground level. What's interesting about this house is that, you know, it's a stone house, and normally when you build a stone house, you're going to dig down until you, you, you get really almost bedrock or, or a good footing, and then you begin building the stone house. Well, as people began working in the, in the last uh, you know, 20 years or so, as they began working on this house uh, and doing some, rest, some restoration work, they found that this house is actually resting on huge locust timbers. This house is essentially floating on the landscape. Now, it's a stone house, but it actually has as footers huge locust beams underneath, right? which is very unusual. So if this area here was a supporting area you know, for summer kitchen or whatever, then what was this upper level? Well, this upper level, in fact, was dwelling space, either for relative on the, on the farm or maybe for laborers, but someone lived here. And in fact, the floor plan up above, because of the center chimney, is a three-room floor plan house. So if you actually have a you actually have a, a building that has more than one function, various agricultural support functions on the lower level. What time this works in some area? Here we go. Uh, various agricultural functions on the lower level, and then uh, the upper level, you can see the entrance in the back to this upper level, which was used uh, as, a, as a housing, as a dwelling for somebody on this farm site. And it's, again, it's really, it's a great 18th century profile. Again, center chimney. It really has all the, all the proportions of, of, a, of an 18th century Pennsylvania German dwelling house. So in front of the ancillary building, and connect, almost connected to it, is the spring house. The spring, again, comes up in the cellar of the ancillary house, and then kind of flows out and then back in the spring house, and then through the spring house and out again. Now, this area in the front here has been traditionally known in the community as the trout pond. And apparently in the 20th century, at least, uh, there were trout that were, that were kept here. Uh, but uh, uh, the spring flows through the ancillary building, through this area, and into the spring house. And of course, the spring house is a very large building used for uh, you know, storing and, 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 and keeping various perishables. Now, I will also say that beneath the main 1763 house is also a full cellar and barrel arched uh, cellar so that uh, you've got a lot of space for storing food and provisions, uh, not only in the main house, but also in this, in this spring house. And, uh, you know, this is uh, clearly an 18th century building. I would also think that this is a a pre-1770 building, probably built about the same time as the, as the ancillary house. This is uh, looking straight on at the spring house and the ancillary building behind it, and, and you can see out in front of the spring house uh, flows the spring. And uh, this is usually covered with a bed of watercress. Uh, it's one of the, the trademarks of, the, of this farmstead. And then the spring continues to flow uh, underneath Kaufman Road, uh, and it joins another spring that is kind of housed with this other interesting little structure, which could be a late 18th or early 19th century structure. And these springs continue to flow uh, to out through the, through the property. And this is an excellent spring. It is, it is flowing. I mean, it's, it looks like a creek, uh, you know, but it, is, it is, a, is a flowing spring. It's a very good flowing spring. And, you know, it's hard to really see too well uh, in this photograph, but, but in, in this water, uh, there are shards of uh, clay tiles, there are shards of redware, and, and other, other ceramics uh, that have washed down. And of course, through the years, as these buildings were intensely used, things break, right? And uh, this is a virtual treasure trove of, uh, of, uh, of small little 
fragments of broken pottery. Other, out, other 18th century outbuildings that remain on the farm include the bake oven, the bakehouse. Uh, this, uh, this tin uh, repair is a 20th century vintage, but uh, this also is a building that probably predates 1770. Uh, and uh, opening the door and looking in, they've got the, uh, the oven uh, is still intact. I mean, you could really fire this up and use this if, if you wanted to. It's really museum quality. And uh, a blacksmith shop on this site. Uh, so this building has now been turned into a building that houses the utilities. The heating system for this house is now housed in this building. But this was an 18th century blacksmith shop. And uh, you'll notice that it's sort of connected to this stone wall. There are a number of features on this farm that's sort of all connected. And this is actually a garden wall. So there, was, there would have been a large garden uh, back in this area originally. Another view of the, uh, the back of the blacksmith shop uh, with the, uh, uh, you know, the, the chimney for that would have served the forge. Uh, and, uh, and then this, this garden wall. And you can kind of see how all these features sort of interconnect with one another, communicate with one another. There's the privy. Somebody asked about the privy. Uh, and actually, you know, um, these are the kinds of buildings that, that disappear from farms. And uh, I have to tell you that uh, if you asked me to take you to another standing privy in the Ole Valley, I don't, I'd have to really think about it. I don't know that I could, could think of another privy. And again, I don't, I don't think this is 18th century. It's probably 20th century. But uh, I don't think that I could take you to another privy exactly like this standing in the Ole Valley. These are the things that are often knocked away. Uh, uh, this is a, a, another uh, stone foundation that exists. We believe that this might be the foundation of a smokehouse that, that did come down at some point, probably burned down, <laughs> as these things sometimes did. Uh, but this was yet a, would have been yet another uh, 18th century uh, feature on this farm. Um, the earliest barn. Uh, we believe, stood right across, and still stands right across the street from the main house. Right across, this is Kaufman Road. Uh, this is Kaufman Ho Road looking, looking west. And this is the other side of this building. This is Kaufman Road looking east. Uh, we believe that this uh, early barn was a, was a ground barn, not a bank barn. Uh, and it was stone in the bottom with log up on top. However, this barn burned and was rebuilt probably in the late 19th century. Uh, with all timber framing and, and of course wooden clad and now, but we believe that this actually was uh, the earliest barn on this site. Now, it's one of the interesting things about farming in the 18th century is that, again, these farms were based on, on grain and wheat. And you don't need huge barns for that type of farming because you don't have huge herds of dairy cattle, okay? So you have workhorses, maybe you have some oxen, you got some sheep. Uh, you got some hogs, uh, but, but you don't need quite the large barn as you need when you get into the dairy operation. So this, uh, this is very much in keeping with the size of uh, grain uh, farming barns that would have existed in the 18th century. Okay, so um, at the uh, kind of the east end of this cluster of buildings are the larger barns which remain today. And for many years, uh, you know, people driving by would look at these barns and they would say, well, you know, this looks like it's the earlier barn because it's smaller. This must be the larger barn up here because it's, it's a little bit bigger. Uh, how many people here know the name Bob Ensminger? All right, somebody. Bob Ensminger is an incredible barn scholar. He's still living. He's in his 90s. Uh, and he's written extensively on barns. And he's just an incredible guy. He was a, a professor at Kutztown University. And uh, uh, not too many years ago, I had the opportunity to go through these barns with Bob Ensminger. And we're, we went through both of these barns, and I said, Bob, what do you think as far as dates? You know, and he said, and, I, and the more I thought about it, the more I agreed, that these two barns are roughly contemporary with each other. They were probably built within 10 years of each other. And he believes, and I, and I agree, that this barn was most likely a barn built for horses, 
And this was the barn built for dairy. And uh, remember, uh, remember the Jacob Kaufman who was doing all that construction work in the 1830s. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, he, he built the first part of the, what became the Isaac Kaufman uh, house. Uh, and then he built the, the apartment. And then he split off the, the two farms. Um, it's very likely that he built these two barns about that same time. Uh, and it's very likely that, in fact, this larger dairy barn dates from the mid, eight, the mid to late 1830s. And it's very likely that this smaller barn might date about the same time or maybe 10 years earlier, but roughly the same period of time. And you know, one of the things that's interesting is that these two barns both have very similar roof lines. They have very, very similar fenestration. Mm -hmm. They also have very similar four bays. So you see, this is a four bay, but it's more, more of the type of four bay you find in a Pennsylvania standard barn, and that is more of a recessed four bay. It isn't a cantilevered four bay that you see in 18th century barns. And when you have a cantilevered four bay, what you'll have is that you'll have this roof line come down, and then if the four bay will be out here so that this front of the roof in this section, this is going to be longer than the back section. It's going to be an asymmetrical roof line, right? Mm -hmm. But when you have roof lines like this, with a, a kind of a, a symmetrical roof line, <coughs> you're looking at the barn architecture, which was common from the 1830s. Now, why all this construction in the 1830s? Why, why did all this happen in the 1830s? Because this is precisely the time that the agricultural economy of Pennsylvania farms changed particularly the farms in the Oli Valley. The farms transitioned from grain to dairy. And why did they transition from grain to dairy? Because you have the rise of the cities, and you have transportation that made transporting milk feasible. And you know, it was kind of fascinating when you think about um, the rise of the cities in the 1830s, it relates to iron, right? In the mid-18th century, you have your, your raw material, iron ore, right? So it was more economic to bring the people, the workers, to the resources, right? So you have all these iron villages out in the middle of nowhere, but that's where the ore is, and that's where the hardwood is, right? But by the 1830s, with the rise of railroads, it was more economical to bring the resources to where the people were living in the cities. You know, why build, all, why, why, build, why, build, why build housing for your workers? They're living in the cities, right? Well, so there's not a lot of other reasons for the rise of the cities, but at the time that the cities were rising, that technology was changing, that trans transportation was undergoing a revolution, you have uh, the, the agricultural economy dramatically changing. And that is when you see all of these large dairy barns being built and, and it certainly coincides with what was happening here on the Kaufman farm. So that in many respects, you can study this farm, and, and, and really what you're really studying is farming in the Ole Valley in microcosm, because it's reflecting in many ways uh, things that were happening across, across uh, not only the valley, but across Pennsylvania. So let's take a look at these two barns a little bit. Here's the here's smaller barn out front. Again, the front, here's this recess kind of four bay, here's the gable end with fenestration, and of course there are limestone. Uh, here's the back of the barn with these really cool arch doorway openings, and in fact, you see a couple arches in the large dairy barn as well. Um, and uh, and again, the, the, again, the same fenestration on this gable end. Uh, inside, uh, you're looking at the inside of that uh, arch doorway, and uh, you've got uh, this piece over here that would uh, probably accommodate the tackle and, uh, uh, and, the, and the, the tack for the horses, uh, the harnesses, and what have you. Uh, there's another cool little, uh, little detail in this barn, which remember Bob Ensminger pointed out. Uh, we're going through, going through this barn and he says, wow, look at that, that's a sprinkle, that's a sprinkle bar. I said, a what? So you see this bar here across, this is how you could you could keep these doors open, but put this bar across to keep your horses from getting out. 
Well, this bar slides into a recess. Here it is in the open position, right? So, it, so what's interesting about this is that, you know, this piece of wood was inserted at the time the barn was built. You can't put it in later, you know. And uh, last October, we're getting ready for a tour. We're going to do the barn of this barn. And I, and I walked in, and a couple other people were, were with me who hadn't been in here before. And I said, "Oh, oh, look." I almost forgot, this is a spriggle bar. And so I took this thing and I whipped it across and it disappeared into the stone wall. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, what did I do? And then I looked and I realized the clever farmer in 1834 put a ring on the end of it. <laughs> and I was saved. I was able to reach in the recess and pull it out, right? Otherwise, it would have been like, well, I guess we aren't going to show that spriggle bar because. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to be able to get it out. Anyway, it's one of the cool details that you sometimes come across with uh, uh, any any old building, but particularly uh, the, the, the things on the coffin farm. You, you, you just turn around and you see this, these little great little details. Well, here's the large the large dairy barn, and this is a large, massive dairy barn. Uh, and but you can get a sense that it's built in many respects the same as that that smaller barn. It's the same kind of fenestration. Again, it faces south. Uh, here's the back of the barn, uh, and this is a bank barn. Of course, a smaller barn is a ground barn, right? Because it isn't built into a bank. But the large barn is, a, is built into a bank, so it has this ramp in the back, which accesses the upper level. It also has a granary coming down off the back, and it's got a double, double doors, double uh, threshing floors. So it's a, it's a huge barn. Uh, and uh, inside, you get a sense of uh, the massive uh, space and the amount of space, and of course, if you've got a herd of, of let's say, 50 or 60 or more uh, milk cows, you've got to feed them year-round, right? And they're going to they're going to graze in the summer, but you've got to put away prodigious amounts of hay uh, for the winter months. And so uh, that, this large barn would have accommodated uh, that. And uh, again, this uh, this is very very common, um, you know, construction that you would find um, 1830s, 1840s. I'll get you that. Yeah. All right. You mentioned the economic changes around 1830 that shifted to dairy. So mm -hmm. I'm looking at this kind of structure. What's involved with, uh, let's say, capital outlay? Did it's all sweat Ex labor? Excellent. Ex well, you, you know, or bank loans? How do they build? Correct. Some of you, that's a that's an excellent question. And um, of course, by the 1830s, there were banks. Okay. Right. So you could go to lending institutions in the 1830s, but uh, what did you do in the 1760s? What did you do in the 1760s? Well, I'm involved with an organization that owns another house in the Ole Valley called the Kime House. And uh, I was recently reading the, uh, the inventory of Jacob Kime, uh, taken after he died, right? And, uh, and so his inventory had a total of value of, and I don't, have this off the top of my top of my head. I'm trying to think now. It was something like it might have been it might have been about 800 pounds was the total amount. Now it's not important to understand what 800 pounds means, but of that 800 pounds, 600 of of the worth of his inventory was book debt, which meant people owed him money. People were coming to him and borrowing money. And in fact, in the 18th and I think well into the early 19th century, you'd say, oh, you want to build a barn? Go see Shaky, right? Because he had the cash. And the other thing about any of these buildings, which I didn't point out, and, and I shouldn't, it's obvious to me, but not always obvious to everybody, these buildings weren't built by the by the Kaufmans themselves. They hired people. <coughs> all these houses, all these barns were built by professional house rights or or or, or barn rights. They, these were professionals. But if you didn't go to a lending institution, which did exist by the nineteenth century, mid nineteenth century, you could go to a local farmer or a relative, you know. And 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 in fact, when we looked at the Kime inventory. And we looked at notes that, that people owed him money. A lot of it was relatives, you know, because, you know, it's kind of like uh, 
Oh, you know, <laughs> you might be my son, but, uh, you know. <laughs> money is money and schnapps is schnapps. <laughs> I noticed this barn has lightning rods. But on all the other buildings, I saw no lightning rods. What's the distinguishing characteristic to not have them or to have them? That's a good question. You're, you're right. You do see light, lightning rods in some buildings and, and not in others. And I don't know the answer to that. I think that uh, um, I think light, lightning certainly was a hazard. I think that uh, um, I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. What I will say is that one of the other things you will find here and, uh, on the Kaufman farm and many other farms is groves of locust trees. And I know from not only working at but living at the Conrad Weiser homestead uh, where the, the house I lived in, uh, which is an 1834 farmhouse, was on kind of a high ridge, and there's a grove of locust trees. And during the time that I lived there, those trees were struck twice by lightning. They didn't hit the house, though. But uh, I talked to some people who were scholars of Pennsylvania German stuff, and they said, yes, you will find groves of, of locust trees surrounding or associated with early farmsteads, and they believe that sometimes they were planted and did have this quality of attracting lightning. But yeah, I, I think that's a good question. Some of these buildings do, and sometimes some, some of them don't have lightning rods. I would think, that in response to the gentleman here, the barns would have it because they're more likely to go on flame with all the straw. Well, that, that's very that's very true. That's very true. And they're they're high. I mean, this, yeah, they're the so highest they're building on the farm as well. Or if they hit a house, you wouldn't have that in there. Yep. So. Uh, these are some of the other agricultural buildings that are in between the house and those barns. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've got, uh, we've got a, a stable shed, a pig sty, and, and a corn crib over here. We'll kind of go through these just briefly. Uh, this, uh, this is an interesting building, which has all the proportions of an 18th century structure. It's a timber frame building, and it's got some really early, you know, construction methods. But um, when some of the people have been doing some restoration work in this building, they also found you know, mid 19th century nails that were part of this building. And uh, long story short, I think, it's a, I think it's very likely that this was an 18th century structure which was moved to this site in the 1840s or 50s. And what was it used for? It probably was some type of a stable. It has a, uh, or, you know, it might have been for sheep, uh, for housing animals of some type. It's got a dirt floor, uh, but it's got, it's got all the proportions, in, in fact, there's a building almost exactly like this, Mike, that's stone on the Griesmer farm, uh, which is at the intersection of, of, of Old, Old Turnpike Road and 662, with the one with the railing. There's a stone building exactly like this, same proportion, which I've never been in, but that's, that's some kind of a, an animal housing unit, uh, and this, I think it's used today for heifers. So, I mean, this could have been used for heifers or sheep or something like that. Now, the interesting uh, thing is, is that uh, when uh, they were doing some re research on this building, they found that uh, it had originally this side lap shingled roof. And so they, they, they put it back on. And a side lap shingled roof like this is the common way that, that Germans shingled roofs in the 18th century. But it is a practice that continued into the 19th century as well. Uh, and and you know, the, one of the things about these, uh, side, these are called side lap shingles. Uh, because in addition to, to, in addition to lapping, you know, the way shingles usually lap like this, these lap also sideways, right? And, and they are laid in courses so that they line up in straight files, right? Yeah. From bottom to top. Uh, and so it has a different look. The way these shingles, the, the shingles are also long shingles, so that these shingles are, are sometimes as long as 39 inches long. But the way that they are lapped sideways and lengthwise, you get three courses, you get three layers of wood over the entire roof, right? Uh, but it's a very distinct Germanic way of, 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 of roofing a building. And um, I'll, 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 throw, I'll throw this out here because we, Mike and I have talked about this. Um, in uh, September 1862, there's a Civil War battle fought called the Battle of Antietam, right? It was, it was fought in Sharpsburg, Maryland. And a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of Civil War photographers took pictures of the battlefield area after the battle, right? So why does that remain to us? Well, that part of Antietam was settled by Pennsylvania Germans. Sharpsburg is a Pennsylvania German town, right? The, the houses are center chimney German houses, right? 
one of the things on the battlefield was a Dunkard meeting. Where did the Dunkards come from? They came from here, right? So one of the great things about the, the photographs taken of the Battle of Sharpsburg, there are several buildings in those photographs with side lap shingles. So they were shingled the common Pennsylvania German way. Uh, and, and, and here's a great example of what, what that looks like. So this is this really interesting <coughs> stable on the barn. Uh, here's a pigsty. And, and uh, we don't know when this pigsty was built. Uh, it might have been built, if I say it was built 1860, you could, you could take two, two decades on either side of that. And within that span of years is when the pigsty could have been built. Incidentally, this is another type of building which is disappearing from our farms. And we're very lucky that the pigsty remains here. Uh, if, you, if you ask me to take you to see other pigsties in the Ole Valley, I don't know, I, I think I know of two others that are not piggeries, which were bigger buildings, but pig styes like this. There might, I might be know of two, two others. Well, there used to be that really beautiful one just on 419 right. I, east of here that in my time first coming to Cornwall still had pigs in it. Yep. And now it's gone off of that farm, unfortunately. It, that, was the, that was the only, that was, and I never stopped and took and a it, picture. And it looked it almost identical. It looked to exactly this like this. It was, it was on 419 between Cornwall and Schaeferstown. I was on a, not raised, but spent a lot of time on a farm in Albany Township. Yeah, yeah, County, yeah. And we had a big stop. How about that? And How about that? It was used when I was on there. That's great. That's great. <clears throat> Jimmy, have a question? Yeah, I have oh. a question. Oh, yes. The, I, I'm telling you, those metal roofs were probably standing seam tenors. Yes. And yes. Were, were they, do you think those buildings were originally built with those, or were they, did no. they eventually, they covered the shingle roofs eventually? Right. right. Yeah. This was a later repair. A later repair. When, when did that happen? When did they start doing standing seams? Well, I mean, I think it was it was known. I mean, you had met, you had metal roofs in the nineteenth in the mid nineteenth century. You had metal, but actually you had metal metal roofs in the early nineteenth century. There was a tinsmith in Burnville, Berks County, who moved into that area in the eighteen forties. And when he was an older man, the Reading Eagle would go ahead and interview him. So this would be like in the eighteen eighties. And he talked about in the 1860s, his business really changed. And from then on, he made very few items that you think of a tinsmith making, like tin cups and things of that nature. He said from that time on, he made he mainly did roofs and pipe for, uh, so for pipes. stoves. Mm -hmm. And at that time, he said there wasn't a roof within eight miles of Burnville that he and his crew hadn't put on. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, from, from that, because you know, I think that's pretty uh, illustrative of that, that it seems like you know, right at that Civil War time period is when people were doing that. And I've seen a number of farms when you look under it, you see a shingled roof under it, tin roof on top. That's why I asked the question, our, our, I'm pretty sure that our house and farm were originally shingled and the tin, tin was put over top, yeah. 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 We also have, uh, there's a, a corn crib building, uh, and again, this could be anywhere from who knows, 1870, 1860, 1870, on into the 20th century. Uh, and it's a shed over here, which is kind of known as the, the chicken shed, and it was probably used as a chicken shed in the, in the you know, more recent years. But it, it's got a stone, there's a limestone foundation. So who knows what, what was there uh, originally. So I've got just a couple shots of the Isaac Kaufman farm, which is next farm down the road. Uh, and this is the uh, kind of grouping of buildings. Uh, that you see from the road. This is Coffin Road. And here's the main house, uh, which is dated 1832. And what's interesting, and, and you know, we have not done that extensive research on all the Coffins, on, on all the land deeds, on all the documents to fully understand what was going on. Uh, but this is, this is Jacob, Jacob Coffman II, right? Jacob Hill Coffin. He was a busy guy in the 1830s. Because in 1832, he built this house, and he and, he and his wife's name are on the date stone, right? Jacob and Susanna Coffin, 1832. Two years later, he builds the addition onto the old 1763 house, splits the property, gives Isaac this house, and Jacob the other house, and he and his wife move into the retirement apartment. And he probably builds the barns on both of these farms. So he was a very busy guy 
in the 1830s into the 1840s. But this is the, the house. This is a lovely farm, and of course, this is also privately owned as well. Uh, very well maintained, and, and still, a, 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 it's still a working farm as well. Um, I have not gone through this barn extensively, but I would find, I, I, I have a good idea that this barn was built almost the same year as the, as the other barn, as the other dairy barn. I think it's very, very similar. So, um, before we go to questions, I should say just a, a little bit about the Kaufman Farm. First of all, the, the 120-acre Kaufman Kauf, Farm uh, uh, is undergoing protection. Uh, first of all, uh, Berks County has uh, an ag preservation program whereby the county buys the development rights uh, as long as you keep the, the, far, the land in farming. And that has been done so that the development rights are, are the, the land will never be developed as long as, and of course, it has to be farmed. And so uh, the, the, the land is rented out for farming and, and, and so the, the, the land is protected at that point. It will always be in farming. Um, and last year, uh, an organization was, actually two years ago, an organization was formed called the Friends of the Kaufman Farm, and I'm, I'm kind of a part of that. And we are working very close with the current landowner who is really concerned about the future of the farm. Now, the idea is that the Kaufman Farm will not be a museum. Uh, you know, my 42 years <laughs> of, of managing historic sites has given me a lot of insight on how much money it takes to operate and run and maintain. And so we want the Kaufman Farm to be in private hands, but with some protections. And so we're working with the landowner right now that when the time comes that the property will change hands, there will be protective easements in place uh, to protect the buildings as the land is now being protected as well. Uh, and we hope to be able to work with the current and hopefully future owners to be able to continue to do research on the farm uh, and maybe do some educational program. Again, it's never going to be a museum, but that doesn't mean that it could be maybe open for some study by scholars. And there, there might be uh, the possibility that in a very limited use and, li and limited, limited way, uh, the public can at some time come and see the buildings and, and Enjoy the, the structure, um, and we want to continue to do research. Again, there's a lot of about the, the farm that we don't know. Um, uh, we don't know um, exactly how that 1763 house was used, um, uh, and we need to do a lot more research on the family members who actually were living there and who was doing what. Uh, and uh, the good news is that uh, really in in Berks County. Uh, the, the county records are, are really pretty rich and, and preserved, and uh, inventories, wills, of course the land deeds, things like that are, are in, in really in good shape. So we hope to be able to learn more and more about this farm, and, and it remains a, a centerpiece of the Ole Valley, and whenever we do tours of the Ole Valley, of course, this is a place that we always, we always stop at, uh, and we, again, it is privately owned, so it can't, we can't necessarily always trudge around the property, but we do go by the, the property, and it is a stop, and it's any, any, anybody who, who would go to the Ole Valley should, should drive by the Coffin Farm and, and see these buildings, because they are quite remarkable. Uh, I like to say that in, in some respects, in some respects, the Coffin Farm is, is more important than the sum of its parts, right? Uh, be, because of, again, because everything taken into account, all the buildings spanning the years, the state of preservation, uh, of course, the, the fact that this one family was involved there for over 250 years make it really quite, quite, a, quite a treasure for all of us. So, that's it. Yeah. When it left the Kaufman family, was it because there were no, no descendants or because the descendants weren't interested in farming? I'm not exactly sure. I don't, I don't know that there were descendants interested in, in, in the house. And actually, the last Kaufman sold it before he died. It was 90, he died in 97, but he actually sold it. And um, the, the people who bought it actually already have a farm in Ole. And, and, and they, have, they have some means. So they, were, they, they, were, they never moved into the place. 
but did a lot of careful restoration through the years. And so um, I think because of what they wanted to do and, and their commitment to preserving it made them an attractive buyer. Mm -hmm. Who owns the second farm, the, the last one? Uh, I know the name. Petersheim. Peter, Peter, Petersheim, yep. Is that under the... Uh, uh, under the uh, the ag preservation, yeah, I think it might be, but I, I'm not sh sure. But I, I'm I'm sh I'm sure it is. Yeah. I'm sure it is. Yeah. The name of that bar that you talked about, I didn't catch what you were calling. A Spriggle bar, S P R I G G L E. <laughs> yeah. When what was it, 1830 something? They built the other house. Yeah. Uh, I, didn't get a close look at it, but did the front oh, of the house yes. have the squared stone, so to speak, as the original No, this is name? rubble stone. But right. it, no, this is like regular, just kind of rubble stone. So okay. it isn't squared, but this is a center hall symmetrical facade, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, again, one of the interesting things about the Oli Valley in that you had, you had these early settlers, of course, who came in, and they were building center chimney, small, you know, three-room houses, usually one-story log or stone, you know, and then those who became, you know, prosperous, like the Kaufmans and, and the Kimes and, and the Bertolets and, and, and some others, uh, built larger two-story versions of, the, of these houses in the mid-18th century, very prosperous farmers. By the time you got to the 1780s or 90s, however, the prosperous farmhouses were not those German center chimney three room floor plan houses. By the 1780s and 1790s, the, ha the, the prosperous houses that were being built by prosperous farmers in the Ole Valley were this, a center hall, four square, Georgian floor plan house. And what's interesting is that um, that isn't necessarily what was happening in parts of Lancaster and Lebanon County. Um, where, where they were, they were, where in some of these other areas, people retained that that three room floor plan much later. But in Oli, they assimilated and became quote unquote English very early. Uh, the grandest house that remains in the Oli Valley is the Fisher House, built between 1799 and 1801, and it is a grand, full Georgian. Center Hall, four square house. And the Fishers were just Pennsylvania German farmers. And that farm is still owned by the Fisher family. But they aspired to this house type that they were seeing in, you know, in Philadelphia. And again, um, when we talk about, uh, you know, grain being wagoned and sent to Philadelphia for sale. So what, what was, why are we taking it to Philadelphia, you know? Well, because it, it wasn't that the, people in Philadelphia were, were, were gobbling up all this wheat flour. What's Philadelphia? Port. Philadelphia is the largest port in the colonies, right? Mm -hmm. So all the ships coming into Philadelphia, bringing people to the city and other things, well, they're not leaving empty. They're not going back, they're not deadheading back to England with a, with a ship. They are taking grain uh, or probably flour. Uh, some of the flour is going to the Caribbean. We believe that probably it was Pennsylvania wheat flour which fed the slaves in the Caribbean because they weren't growing wheat in Jamaica, right? They were growing wheat uh, on Hispaniola. They were growing sugar cane. But Pennsylvania wheat was feeding those people. Wheat flour was also going back to Europe. And quite often, the price of the grain and the, the price of wheat on the docks of Philadelphia was being determined by how, how well harvests were going in Europe. So, in the mid we know that 1750, I always take 1750 as, uh, as kind of a common year. It was a kind of a middling year, but we know that in the year 1730, out of the port of Philadelphia was shipped 30,000 tons of Pennsylvania wheat flour. Well, these people were making the money from that wheat flour. So uh, later, you know, in the first decade of the 19th century, 
when you have the fishers and other people building these big Georgian houses and they're making tons of money, well, why are they making tons of money? What's happening in Europe? What's happening in Europe between 1800 and 1815? Napoleon is marching across Europe, burning fields. <laughs> And they're, or they're raising armies of hundreds of thousands, and they can't, they can't harvest their grain. So, um, you know, Pennsylvania, you know, reaped the benefits of those wars. Um, and uh, and, you, and you, you can see it in, in, in these houses in the Olde Valley. But, but what's interesting is that uh, when, when they were building prosperous farmhouses from about the 1780s, 1790s on, this is what they were building. They weren't building what they knew back in the Rheinfalls. They were building what they saw in Philadelphia and other areas where they were going, you know, to, to see this, this matter of taste and style. And, you know, assimilation was really happening a lot. I mean, with, with really within the first generation, assimilation was happening. And, and we did, sometimes we don't think of it. Even the, you know, the Pennsylvania Standard Barn, like that big dairy barn, you know, that's not a barn that you see in the Rheinfalls. But that, that barn is really, and I'm not, I'm not the, the barn scholar by any means, but a standard Pennsylvania barn is, is really a combination of both Germanic and English barn styles that intersected and came together in Pennsylvania and created a distinct thing. You know, yes, it's a bank barn, and yes, they were bank barns in Switzerland, and, and there were four bays and what have you, yes, but there also were bank barns in uh, the Lake District in England as well. So at any rate, all of these buildings, by the time you get, by the time you get to the end of the 18th century and the early 19th century, uh, you know, you have a, you know, what, what, what you have on the landscape is something that's distinct and is a combination of, of, of Germanic and, and English stuff that came together and formed a very distinct Pennsylvania style. It really did. Uh, I'll take you first, then. Okay. I... I asked before about whether that was squared on the front of there. Yes. But um, I always was under the impression that the squared stone was a status symbol and was done on the front of the house. Correct. Okay. But the, the picture you showed of the original house had that heavy, ex exaggerated uh, mortar. Yes. And I didn't think that was common way back then. I think that something was newer. No, you actually do. You do actually see that on some 18th century, 18th century buildings, and uh, in some cases they even paint it to exaggerate. Yeah, yeah, I, I've seen that, in, but I in, in the period I've seen that, but I I've never seen one real old that had that exaggerated. I'm trying to think of some other examples that off, offhand. Um, um, what 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 you often what you often see, and what I've seen in some some buildings. Um, as an example, in, in Pottstown, Pottsgrove Manor, which was built in right. 1758, that's a limestone building, right? Mm -hmm. But the front of it is cut stone, right? And it's cut like brownstone, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, but it's only in the front facade, right? You know. And uh, there's some um, on 419. Like the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the uh, uh, well, the George Douglas house is the same way. The front is cut is cut stone, and so. Uh, if you couldn't bring in cut sandstone, uh, another possibility is is to, is to shape the limestone as square as possible, but you can really accentuate it with the with the, with the mortar. Actually, I um, I saw that oh, man. it was near Elko. It was a house that uh, what's his name? The guy who, who he restored the log house in Lebanon. You know him. Bill Ross. Bill Ross. Bill Ross oh, took wow. down. Bill Ross took down a house That's right. uh, near Elko, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a it was a it was a it was a timber frame structure, but there was also a stone structure in which it, the outside looked like rubble stone, but it was simply by the pointing they actually were able to define it and make the front look more tasteful than it right. than it really than it really was. Somebody else, other question. I'll, I'll, I'll go back yeah. to you then. Well, what is that little house of the uh, addition there? Uh, that frame section over here. Uh, this yeah. is the, this this house is this house, and this is another building on this farm. I I, I have not studied the, the buildings on this farm at all, Harvey. So I do not know. This is a 
And this would be a later addition on the back of this. Now, with this well, house is, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this is an ancillary building or if it was, it was for other housing. Yeah. I'm not really positive. Uh, but this would, would have been a later, probably 1860, 70, something addition on the back of that. Yeah. The, uh, was there any sign that they had a nice house, or weren't they close enough to the river to get ice? Well, the, uh, I, no, I did not see a nice house here. Now, where you <coughs> often find ice houses is in conjunction with mills, because you have a mill pond. And so the mill pond with still water is going to create the ice. So there actually are mills nearby in Oleg where there are ice houses. Uh, but uh, but not on not on this particular farm. There's no body of water big enough, uh, and um, the Schuylkill River I think is too swift flowing for much ice. You get ice flows and what have you. There, this is a little distance from the Schuylkill River, right. probably five miles from the Schuylkill. But um, uh, just down the road from this farmstead was the uh, uh, there was the, the Kirst Grist Mill, which was owned by the Kirst family and later the Bertlett family. Uh, and there was a mill pond, and that mill pond would have created, they would have been ice. I think there's an ice house on, that's Phoebe Hopkins' house. I think, I think there's, a, uh, I think there's a, uh, uh, an ice house on that property. So you have, all, ice houses are more common on houses, on properties where you have mills and mill ponds. Because you have that still water that's going to freeze that would good ice. I visited the Tribalis house. In Virginville. Tribal Bits House, yeah. 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 They, have, they have a big oh, ice yeah. house. Right? Yes. But they got it from I can't think of the the creek down behind it's it's a ways down behind. The Maiden Creek. What is it? Maiden Creek flow through I'm not much? sure. No. It's a small stream. What oh, okay, then it's, it's not the Maiden Creek. It, it, no, it's not as big as the Maiden Creek. It doesn't look that way at that point, but I don't know. The Maiden Creek goes through Virginville. But, 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 but yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. They do a nice harvesting yeah. demonstration. Yeah. To it, yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Well, if anyone has any other questions, I'm sure George, uh, Jim will stick around sure. for a few more minutes. And uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, and thanks for supporting uh, this program. And uh, we hope to see you.